We are so delighted to kick off this four part series. Um, and we're gonna have some fabulous perspectives today to share some stories and practical examples. Um, but before we begin, I wanted to just acknowledge a couple things. Um, I am calling in from the San Francisco Bay Area, the unceded land of the Ohlone people. We welcome you all to also offer your introductions and your land acknowledgement in the chat. And I'd also like to just kind of get us settled out of our heads for a moment and into our bodies. As we are kind of all go, go, go. I know many of us are calling in from parts of the country that have been hit with a major snowstorm. We're still, we're in year three of a pandemic. It's been an intense year already in many, many ways. And um, we're all working pretty hard. Social change work is, it can be very draining. So I'd love to just take a moment for us to close our eyes and take a breath together. So inhaling five, four, three, two, one. Exhaling five, four, three, two, one. Inhaling five, four, three, two, one. Exhaling five, four, three, two, one. Take one more collective breath and fill up as, as much as you can all the way at the top. Take one final sip of air and then exhale, let it all go. Shake it out. Whew. Thank you. Well, we are delighted to be with you all today. If you're here for Trust-Based Philanthropy in 4D, you are in the right place. Today's program is gonna be focused on using trust-based values to transform your grant making. Um, we have four fabulous speakers today. Sarah Walchek, the Executive Director of the Satterberg Foundation in Seattle. Yolanda Lavender, Grant Program and Partnerships Director at Stryker Johnston Foundation in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yolanda Coentro, the President and CEO of the Institute for Nonprofit Practice in Boston, Massachusetts. And Jill Miller, President and CEO of BI3 in Bethesda, Inc. Um, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, welcome our, to our fabulous panelists. We've got a really packed but productive agenda today. Um, we're gonna start with some grounding in what trust-based philanthropy is and why. Um, and then we're gonna bring in Yolanda Cointreau to give us a nonprofit perspective to really reinforce why we're even talking about trust-based philanthropy as a practice that we um, should consider embracing. Then we'll move into perspectives from our three funders, talking about how they have intentionally used their values to transform their grant making practices at their organizations. Our goal is gonna to be to get very concrete and share some clear and concrete examples that you might be able to borrow and bring into your work. And then we're gonna have time for facilitated breakouts. Um, for those of you who are joining us as members of Blue Sky Funder Forum, Environmental Grantmakers Association and SAFSF, um, you will be automatically assigned into your breakout rooms for a group discussion. I also wanna acknowledge that we have some regional partners that have joined us today to facilitate breakout rooms as well. And you'll have an opportunity if you're a member of one of our regional partners to self-select and join a breakout room. And we'll be, we'll be here to help you uh, navigate that. So don't worry if, if you miss some of that, we will definitely talk through the instructions again um, and then if you aren't affiliated with any of the host co-hosting or partner orgs, you can stick around in the main room and I will be there to facilitate a conversation. The point of today is to share stories of transformation, but also to invite you all to share your reflections and your observations along this journey. Some of you have engaged with us in some of this programming in the past, um, and we continue to evolve the way we talk about and think about trust-based philanthropy based on what we hear from our community. So even if you've been with us in the past, we hope that you'll find some new ideas, new insights, new inspiration to support you in your journey. And we also hope that you will, will share your lessons along the way because it's really the collective learning that, it, that encourages us all to continue along this journey. So just to get us grounded on why trust-based philanthropy. Essentially, we have in traditional philanthropy, what we see is a values to practice disconnect. 
And what this means is we often, many of us who do the work in philanthropy are doing this work with really positive values that drive it. Um, in this graphic, you're seeing, you know, here's a message that might not be unlike the mission statement or value statement of some of our foundations in the room. Reducing barriers, advancing opportunity, building a healthy and thriving community. So we, we, we stand behind these values when we do, when we say the, the, when we talk about the drivers of the work. However, somehow over time in our sector, we have actually built up walls that run totally counter to the values that we stand behind. So when we say that we're behind reducing barriers, advancing opportunity, building a healthy and thriving community, our practices, our grant making practices should ideally reflect that. However, we're, we've been operating in a traditional uh, landscape of philanthropy where you know, we're, we're leading with a lot of distrust. There's a lot of hoops and requirements for nonprofits to go through. And it makes it very hard for nonprofits and communities to engage um, with, with our work. So if we truly do stand behind these positive values, it's really important for us to think about how those values are reflected in the way that we practice our grant making. And that we, what we do in trust-based philanthropy is invite uh, a re-envisioning and a reimagining and a realigning of recognizing how our grant making practices can be reflective of the values behind the work rather than countering the values behind our work. So this is the definition of trust-based philanthropy, which you may have seen. Um, it's really fundamentally about addressing inherent power imbalances that exist between funders, nonprofits, and the communities served. So the core of what we're talking about is about redistributing power and being really self-aware about our role and, and our positionality in redistributing that, ultimately toward a vision of a healthier and more equitable nonprofit sector. So we'll talk about the practical expressions of this in grant making, but it really, you know, some of the core practices are multi-year unrestricted funding, streamlined applications and reports, and a commitment to building relationships based on transparency, dialogue, and mutual learning. And you'll hear some great examples of that today. The other thing to know about trust-based philanthropy is that it is not, there's no one size fits all approach. It does not look identical in every organization. <clears throat> One of the things that really does that, that is the common denominator across organizations committed to trust-based philanthropy is a values-based approach. And we talk a lot, we've been hearing a lot about kind of values, aligning values to practice. Values are essentially the fundamental beliefs that guide your organization's work. In, in a trust-based context, your values are your North Star for decision-making. If you ever have a moment of uncertainty, moments of change, values become the fallback of what you go back to as the guide and the compass for how you can work through that. Values are also a really positive and, and useful way of aligning people around a shared vision, both internally and externally in your organizations. Many of us have centered values, have done this values work in our organizations. We have value statements on our websites. And the point is to think about how can we be intentional about having a collective understanding about what those values are and using those values to drive our work. So while not every trust-based foundation will have the exact same language verbatim on what their values look like, many of the values will allude to some of these things that you see on the screen. And these values that we've collected have been um, collected based on conversations with, with a range of different foundations that have committed to the trust-based journey. We actually went to a community of different funders that have committed to this journey and asked them, what are the values that drive your work? And these were the kind of common themes that came up. Working for systemic equity, recognizing that we operate in an inequitable system and society. This, the institution of philanthropy was, was founded based on inequities. I mean, the fact that, you know, there's a handful of people who make decisions about where money goes and have an outsized amount of wealth is inherently inequitable. And then to those folks who have the power to make decisions about the money, deciding where it goes and who can receive it and how they receive it. 
We also are dealing with systemic inequities in our, in our actual nonprofit sector. There's been lots of data out there that demonstrates the imbalances and inequities of the amount of unrestricted funding that is available to black and brown led organizations versus white led organizations. There's lots of data out there about the higher amounts of burnout and stress among people of color leading nonprofits. So there, and there's many other inequities that we see, but ultimately if we're doing social change work, if we're operating in this ecosystem, we must recognize that working towards systemic equity is something we should strive for if we really wanna see the outcomes we wanna see. There's other values around redistributing power connected to that equity point, recognizing you know, the limitations of power being held in the hands of a few and really working to redistribute that. Centering relationships over transactions. A lot of traditional grant making practices are really transactional. So how can we actually center relationships if we truly wanna advance impact in partnership with grantees? How do we build and lean on relationships in order to get there? And on a related note, how do we see our role as funders, as partners in a spirit of service to those leading rather than you know, monitors and compliance officers? So many of our job descriptions even reinforce some of these elements of being compliance oriented and making sure and following up and making sure that the nonprofits are doing what they're gonna do and all these things. And that degrades the ability to build an actual trust-based relationship. We also lead with the value of being accountable. Uh, how can we be accountable to the leaders that we're serving on the ground? How can we be accountable to the communities that we are investing in? Rather than the one way route of accountability where nonprofits and communities have to be accountable to the demands of fun funders and foundations. How do we build a two way street of accountability? And finally, how can we embrace learning, recognizing that we don't have all the answers to the problems we seek to solve and that we can learn alongside our partners that are doing the work in order to improve our work as funders. So these are some of the core values that drive a trust-based approach. In today's discussion, we're actually gonna be talking about what it looks like to take these values and apply it to what we do in our grant-making practices. And so we've recently announced, this is our first webinar series where we're unpacking what we call the four dimensions of trust-based philanthropy. And what, what we are talking about here is using those values, values of centering relationship, redistributing power, working for systemic equity, embracing learning. How do we use those values to drive the whole of our work, our grant making practices, what we do and how we show up as grant makers, our cultures, our organizational way of being, being how we interact with our colleagues, our staff, our boards, our structures, our systems, our hierarchies, our, our, our grant management systems, our policies, the, the, the bones of the work that we do, and then our leadership. So this series is gonna unpack all of this. <laughs> Today, we're gonna to focus in on the grant making practices, but I invite you to listen as our speakers are sharing because you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Can't talk about you know, intentional values aligned grant making practices without talking about the culture building work that needs to happen with staff and board to really understand and have a shared language around values. You can't show up in a, in a trust-based way if your structures don't reflect those same values. And leadership plays a key role in uplifting, upholding, and really uniting us around those shared values. So you'll hear elements of that throughout today's discussion. And then of course, there's the grant-making practices. So when we first started talking about trust-based philanthropy two years ago publicly, we really focused in on these six grant making practices. These are the external expressions that take those values that we talked about, redistributing power, working for systemic equity, centering relationship, partnering in a spirit of service, embracing learning. These are ways that we can actually embody those values in our grant making practices. These are ways of building trust and co the collective practice of these grant making practices can help us not only build trust, but actually have a deeper sense of learning about the work that we're doing and get and it gets us closer to a, a sense of connection of the work happening on the ground so that we can be better funders. So that's the 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 overview 
of trust-based philanthropy. So today, what we're gonna be talking about is those values, how these values can show up in our grant making. But first, I wanted to just welcome Yolanda Coentro, the president and CEO of the Institute for Nonprofit Practice to join me um, in offering a little bit of grounding for our group. So I, Yolanda, I'm so thrilled to have you here with us today, calling in from Boston, having just dealt with a snowstorm last week, <laughs> still digging out of it. Um, but it was really great to just kind of talk with you in advance of today's program, uh, because you're not only a respected leader in the nonprofit sector that has raised millions of dollars and has been doing fundraising work for quite a while, but you also lead an organization that um, offers training and support for other nonprofit leaders around the country. So you have this view of your own experience and also what you're seeing on the ground. Uh, and even, even with the successes that you've had in your leadership and your fundraising, you've described fundraising work as something that can sometimes be soul crushing, which I know others on the line who have ever been on that end of, of, of fundraising can probably relate to that as well. But I would love Yolanda, if you could just share a little bit more about what you mean about that. And just to give some context for folks, like what is it, what are the real things that, that nonprofit leaders are dealing with when it comes to fundraising? Thank you, I appreciate that. And first, just to acknowledge the opportunity you've set up here to have a nonprofit leader's voice in the room. I, we talk about this in our own classes, uh, leaders in nonprofits are having conversations about the effect of fundraising and philanthropy on themselves and their organizations. And then philanthropists are having conversations and foundations about the same things, but we often don't come together. So I just wanna thank you for making sure that that was present here. Um, and I know I use the term soul crushing, which is a kind of profound statement, it might sound like an over-exaggeration. And yet I would say that, you know, the thousands of leaders we work with who are in the role of fundraiser, ED or CEO fundraising um, would describe it in the same way. It's often the reason why they leave the job um, because of the weight and the burden of that dynamic. And, you know, it comes from because you, I would say kind of at a primal level, it's no matter what your upbringing is and how difficult it might be to ask for money, you're putting yourself out there personally and professionally, and you're doing it because you have so much belief in the work that you're representing and so much confidence in its impact. And then when you're, you know, and you're proximate to the work in ways that funders may not be, right? And so because of that, anything that kind of gets in the way of being able to fully express the need, being able to be honest about where the challenges are, um, being able to ask for what you need, it starts to just incrementally take a personal toll. And then obviously it has massive organizational toll if you're ineffective at bringing those dollars in and there are people's lives are literally on the line. You know, it can depend on the work that you're doing, but if you are especially, you know, uh, a leader from a historically marginalized group or a BIPOC leader in your code switching and grappling with imposter syndrome and coming up against bureaucracy that, that kind of gets in the way of your ability to realize what you know your community needs, it just continues to kind of take an incremental toll on your spirit. You wonder if change is possible in the end. Um, and often you're up against funders, maybe not, you know, with really good intentions, not really telling you what they think or not telling you if it's not a good fit or putting you through a lot of effort to then ultimately not be successful at bringing the funds in the door. And so even that dynamic is just so deflating, right? You just put so much into it only to get a no. So I'm often telling funders like, hey, if, it, if this is really not a fit, like let's not waste each other's time. We can still appreciate each other as leaders in the field who have common values. Um, 
But I, I would say, you know, those are some of the dynamics that come up. And so then when you do get funding and you can't be your whole self and you can't talk about changing context or the challenges and barriers you're facing, um, or even fully the successes, if a report doesn't allow for a full picture, it really becomes that it's performative. You're doing what you think the funder needs and you're losing yourself in it, you know, not to get like too abstract and heady, but if you, if you lose yourself in the work, if you're just constantly trying to become what, what someone else wants you to be as a fundraiser, it's just, you know, incredibly difficult to sustain yourself in the work. And that's part of the work that we do. Um, Thank you so much, Yolanda. I just want to lift up um, one, you know, so many nuggets of wisdom in that, but that piece about the performative nature of it. You know, we've, we, in, in philanthropy, we set up all these hoops and, and, and walls and barriers. And it's kind of like nonprofits are kind of set up to try to figure out what they need to say in order to win the grant versus building a genuine relationship. So, and you've painted such a good picture of that for us. When you think about some of your best and most productive funder relationships, what about those relationships, the, the, the good ones, the ones that are relational, that are working against some of those traditional structures? What has been particularly memorable and impactful about those relationships? Yeah, I would say, you know, and that's like increasingly so, right? There's so many people even today on this call. Um, and I would say we're all collectively really working on this. And I, from, from my experience, um, what, what the practices look like are conversations often in place of reporting where we could really talk together and partner together around the whole of the challenge we might be partnering on. Um, a lot more kind of contact that's more personal and less transactional. So whether that's like, let's meet up and have coffee or let's have a conversation over a 20 page report um, or, hey, can you give me feedback on what we've rolled out and how that's landing in the field with the, your peer network? Um, and really taking that feedback, acting on it and looping back, you know, to say, we heard you, so we shortened the, the reporting structure or we opened up the time for which people could apply for funding or we're giving out multi-year funding even when people didn't ask for it. Um, general operating funding when people are applying for program specific funding because the world changes. And so all of those practices that you all share really change the game and I've seen it. They, it's been catalytic for us to get those kinds of gifts and be in relationship with funders who open their networks, give us flexibility, um, and also connect us to other resources that are not about funding. We've been able to scale as a result of that and, and not outside of that because we couldn't do the work without our friends in the work, you know, who also advance our mission and give our mission a platform and the people that we serve platform. So there's just so much opportunity here. And when that's happening, it also fuels the leader. And we know we need leaders who are high performing and not turning over all the time to really execute on our missions. And so when you're also fueling the leader and you're saying, I got you, I'm behind you in these multitude of ways, it's easier to stay in it. It's easier to be in the crisis and see it through because there's an army of people behind you. And I've, I definitely have experienced that as a leader as I've gotten deeper into the work. And I know a lot of folks in our network do, um, but it, you know, it takes time. So you'll see less of that for leaders who are running smaller shops, leaders who are new. And so we have to pay attention to folks in, who are in that kind of zone because they need in a lot of ways, like so much more immediate support than, you know, those of us who might be more settled in it and are trusted, right? Mm. So. so great. And that really taps into that point about working for systemic equity and recognizing the yeah. inequities in our sector. Thank you, Yolanda Cointro, Institute for Nonprofit Practice. Thank you for giving us some real uh, nuggets. And um, I'm pleased to introduce our other speakers to actually talk about how they've done some of that work that Yolanda is speaking to about aligning those values and the practices. So I'm, I'm happy to welcome 
Yolanda Lavender from the Stryker Johnson Foundation, Jill Miller from BI3, and Sarah Welchek from Satterberg Foundation. Thank you all for being with us. Um, so I wanted to just kind of just jump right into it. Um, and, and we'll start with you, Sarah. Um, so at Satterberg, when your foundation's endowment grew dramatically, you had an opportunity to really take another look at your grant making strategy and really re-envision the overall approach. Um, and the, the whole time you really did that with an eye on values. So can you talk us through that process of transformation and how you leaned on values to, to drive the work? And, and I know people here are on that journey and are really listening for like those practical ways of like, what does it look like to go from like, I want to do this to now we're doing it. Oh, hi, everyone. It really excited to be here. Um, just a little quick context. Shadi had acknowledged the kind of growth that we went through and change. The Soderbergh Foundation is a family foundation uh, based here in Seattle, Washington. We make grants in Washington, California, and Arizona, a little bit of national work too. So the family ran the foundation for about 23 years, uh, solely no staff, and it was all volunteer run. Uh, they made a majority of their grants through that time period, getting to approximately $700,000 payout. Our assets were about $4 million. And in 2020, 2012, a bequest came uh, to the foundation, and overnight, the assets grew from $4 million to $400 million. And so it's a critical moment for us. Um, I know a lot of times when I reflect on this is an opportunity, and we we're able to go back to our grant making strategies and reflect on them and change them. I know that that is unique to us. So, you know, it's worth acknowledging that there was a moment there we we were making $5,000 capacity grants. And so there's no way we were going to be able to just make more of those to reach our payout, um, the 5%, but the family already had a commitment to 10%. So it was a, it was a challenging opportunity for us. Uh, I'll give a lot of credit to the family at that time. We paused, we brought in um, Philanthropy Northwest, our philanthropic serving organization here to work with the family to really like get concrete on like, what do we wanna do moving forward? And so what Shadi was talking about is values, and that was our starting place. And I think that can be something all folks do inside their organization, regardless if their assets grew tremendously. You all have people coming in and out of your organization, new staff, new board. And so it's a starting place to reflect on your values, take the opportunity to ground yourself in them. And we spent years too. like, I will walk through this quickly, but this is still a journey we're on. And it's been probably five to six years and we're still having these conversations. But a critical step could be to pause and review the actions, the choices, and the thinking behind your decisions that how you got there. And so grounding them in the values and reflecting those values onto your practice and coming up with some language. So we went through an exhausting amount of conversation, but I think it has been very important to us to get to how that has informed how we do our grant making today. So we've named how our values inspire practice and we went through an exercise called We Believe. So we took our values and started making We Believe statements to identify what those shifts might do to inspire and give us insight into where we were evolving. So if you take a broad value, like one of ours is community, and we have some language, I think it's community in action is in collaboration and mutual support. Like, what does that even mean? And so we were like, okay, let's take it step one step further and say, we believe um, communities are the expert, right? So that means we're going to invest in strategies that are developed in and by community. Okay, so that could inform how we were going to move forward in an actual grant making practice. And all that did when we went into our next year of conversation about this was identify that we should not be making decisions about our grant making strategies in a silo. So we brought in our nonprofit partners who the foundation had funded in the past um, to help inform where we were going. And so they helped us develop our grant making program. And it should be no surprise to anyone that the things that were named were general operating, multi-year grant making, less reporting, more relationships. And so with that conversation, 
we built an entire grant making strategy that was informed with and by community because it was rooted in a value and a we believe statement. Now we have several we, we believe statements, but that is a high level sort of example of how we got from here to here. Thank you so much, Sarah. I love that. I, I, it's, it's great to just get those concretes. And I think one thing to really lift up there is that yes, we often talk about values in our organizations, but we don't spend the time actually making sure that we we all agree with what that what that means and what that practically looks like. So I love that very practical example of going through that we believe exercise. Um, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. Um, Yolanda Lavender, we're gonna go to you next. Um, so you bring a, a perspective as a former nonprofit ED and you've brought that experience into your work at Stryker Johnson Foundation, also a family foundation. Um, can you share a little bit about how you came into SJF at a time of transition, how you brought in your own experience as a nonprofit ED to help inform and shape the way you do grant making now at SJF. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you, Shadi, for that question. And uh, thank everybody for uh, being in this space. I'm really grateful to share uh, my experience with trust-based philanthropy. Um, so absolutely my experience as a former nonprofit ED um, and, and as a black woman uh, in that role definitely informs uh, every part of the work that I do now uh, with the Stryker Johnson Foundation. So I resonated um, a lot with uh, some of the things that Yolanda C shared around just remembering like this very oppressive, anxiety ridden, transactional, very detached um, experience that I would have with, uh, with funders. And so I was excited when I got to the Stryker Johnson Foundation to learn um, about, you know, a lot of these uh, practices that I already, you know, came in uh, with the understanding like, yes, I want to definitely remember what my experiences were and make sure that as I'm interacting with our grant partners that I don't, uh, that they don't have that same experience. Um, and little did I know that that was trust-based philanthropy, uh, which was already getting started at SJF. Um, so Stryker Johnson Foundation, um, a, a private family foundation started in 1995 um, with the overarching priority uh, funding priority of the elimination of intergenerational poverty specifically in Kalamazoo County, Michigan. Um, and so uh, again that trust based work had already started um, to begin and so being able to come into uh, SJF and really focus in on okay so how do we take this to the next level has been really um, exciting for me so um, we really look at intentions around uh, specifically and again intentionally supporting organizations that are led by and serving black people, people of color and those from other historically excluded groups. Um, we talk about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, access, anti bias, anti racism work. Um, but for us, it's about getting beyond the checkbox opportunities and like trainings and things that folks might uh, attend, but really um, having those conversations and understanding how that work uh, shows up for folks. So, you know, in order to have that uh, kind of conversation and get to that, you really do have to be intentional about prioritizing relationship building and being transparent. Uh, with folks. So, you know, I can remember countless conversations with folks saying, you know, at SJF, we're not going to be asking you to do anything that we're not doing. And so here's the steps that we're taking um, around our own uh, DEI work and anti-racism work and where we are with that and understanding that it's a journey. Uh, now help us understand, you know, also where uh, where you are. So I, I've just learned and been able to see how you're able to get um, into that those conversations deeper and in a more transparent way when there's a relationship um, that's being built and that's that's already there. Um, we also, in terms of just thinking about the values and, and priorities of SJF, um, so this idea of wellness, uh, which we actually really over the last year have um, gone deeper with folks around what that looks like. So just the understanding of the need for flexibility um, during multiple pandemics over almost you know three years now. So I would definitely say that uh, at the start of 2020, it just opened up a brand new opportunity for us at SJF to lean even further into like, okay, how do we really live out this whole trust-based thing? Um, so it, it really did go from, you know, this being a focus on the way that we do our grant making to this is a part of the way that we just are and that we live at, at SJF. 
Um, so this idea of wellness, you know, uh, thinking about people over profit, people over productivity, again, based on the right relationships and uh, conversations that we're able to have with folks, understanding how they really are prioritizing that and uh, being open with them about the fact that we want that to be a, a priority for them, that, that they have the um, power to be able to really lean into that. Um, and then, of course, I, I love, uh, Shadi, just the intention for uh, this conversation today around like the concrete um, and practical steps that folks are taking that, that might be helpful. So I'm, I'm happy to share um, some of those. So streamlining our um, processes, asking for less <laughs> from our grant partners and us doing more of the work. Uh, we're always going back to the drawing board and looking at ways that we can just continue to do that. Um, of course, multi-year and unrestricted funding. I just made a note uh, from something that I heard Yolanda C say around even just offering that and you know there maybe not even being another option for um, anything but we are automatically out of the gate want to say that multi-year and unrestricted funding is um, is just you know the the name of the game for us um, no final reporting so we just have reflection conversations uh, with our grant partners I had one uh, earlier today and it's always interesting because it does still take folks a little bit of time to catch on, uh, you know, and trust that we really um, are uh, just embedded and really intentional about this trust-based thing. Um, so just even the still surprise of like, no, what, no final report? Like we can just, you know, have a, a quick conversation, um, but knowing that folks are in that place and being committed to like walking alongside them and helping them to just get even more comfortable um, with that soliciting feedback, but also utilizing it. So at the end of each grant round, we'll go um, back together as a team and say like, okay, what did we hear that worked? What do we need to get rid of? What can we do differently? Um, so very intentional about not just asking for feedback, but actually doing something with it uh, once we ask. And then defining what partnership and relationship looks like together with our grant partners. So it's not that we say, uh, here's the way that this is going to go. Um, but we really look to be informed by our grant partners um, around what that would look like. Um, so yeah, I know I, have a, I will have a chance to share a few other things uh, later on, but yeah, I think that's it for now. Thank you so much, Yolanda. You're speaking to a, a few of the values that we talked about, being accountable, um, you know, redistributing power by making sure that there's, you know, the decisions aren't just being made at, you know, at the foundation level, it's being informed. So I hope you all are really hearing, you know, some of these interconnected values and also your point about the fact that you're committed to embodying those values in the way you operate as an organization. So the cultural aspect of this too is, is so tied to it. Um, thank you so much, Yolanda. We'll be back to hear more from um, both Yolanda and Sarah on some more specifics. Um, but going next to you, Jill, at BI3, also not coincidentally, you've been on the grant receiving end also. <laughs> so you kind of bring some of that experience uh, in your work in, as well. Um, and so Jill just wanted, you know, you, you came to BI3, which was very traditional in its grant making practices and came with a vision of evolving that. Um, so can you sh share a little bit about that journey of transformation? Also specifically, how did you get the board on board with those, uh, those shifts? Because that's a question that often comes up in a lot of these conversations. Absolutely, well, I'm excited to be here today and, and excited to be um, in Cincinnati going to the Super Bowl. Um, it's been 30 years for us, <laughs> needless to say, we're very excited. Um, but thank you all so much. I'm excited to be here. And as, as Shadi said, when I joined uh, BI3 in 2014, we were a very traditional grant maker. Um, we developed our RFP based on what we thought the community needed. Uh, we had lengthy reporting processes, um, onerous application processes. Um, and really we're focused on those outcomes, driving better care, better health and lower costs as a health funder. Um, BI3 today, our strategic priority is health equity. We envision a day where every person has a fair and just opportunity to achieve their best health. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do. And what we have found is um, as, we, as I joined the organization and once I had my feet under me, um, my colleague and I really decided we didn't want to practice in this traditional way. Um, and so, you know, we started having more conversations with our grantees and saying, you know what, don't submit a report, um, let's talk. And what that conversation allows you to do is really 
walk in the trenches with your grantee. What is working well? What isn't working well? What barriers are we facing? Where do we need to pivot? Um, in our application process, uh, you know, you will get applications and budgets and what you'll find is a grantee they're so used to the scarcity mentality that they try to submit a budget that is so tight um, that we know what they're trying to do. There's not enough dollars there to do it. And so we've actually gone back to grantees, applicants to say like, you need more money. You need to build in um, more, um, support for, um, you know, uh, the listening piece or evaluation and learning piece or um, someone at sustainability is a huge issue with a lot of the more innovative initiatives we fund. And so, you know, what resources do you need to start thinking about sustainability from day one, not waiting until the end of that third year to figure out how you're going to keep things going. And so that, that conversation, I can't say enough about how important that is and allows you to learn. Um, it allows you to identify new opportunities. And, you know, from a board perspective, um, and, and, I, and I regress, and I, and I must say that when my colleague and I started doing these things, we didn't even know what trust-based trust philanthropy was a thing until we were at a conference and saw Pia and Fonte speak about trust-based philanthropy. And I remember we looked at each other like, oh, what we do is a thing. And then we just drank the Kool-Aid, like, um, looking at the, the principles that Shadi shared and really trying to incorporate them. Um, but with the board, you know, I remember sharing with them a lot of the, the approaches that we're taking and the things that we're doing um, are in line with this trust-based philanthropy that we just learned about. And with the board, I must say, we talk a lot about trust. And I think from a leadership standpoint, you have to have that trust with your board. Um, and I'm grateful that my board, I've built a lot of trust with them to be able to say like, this is the approach we need to take. We need to be a trust-based philanthropist. It not only leads to better outcomes, um, but it leads to learning and new opportunities. Um, it, it, that creates overall impact and, and broadening their lens to think about impact. It's not just outcomes. When we prioritize learning, the work is so much richer. It leads to better outcomes. Um, and a great example I lift up around this is the work we've done in the infant mortality space. And I remember back in um, 2013, you know, the goal was to reduce infant mortality in Hamilton County by 10%. Hamilton County is the third largest county in Ohio population wise. And uh, it was a big audacious goal. And when we got into it, we realized they were never gonna achieve that outcome. Um, but what we did, the work was so much richer. We broke down silos, we brought competing healthcare systems together. We worked with nonprofits who had the trust of the black community we were trying to work with because it is a black and inf infant death crisis. We talked with moms and engaged them in the type of model of care they needed. We put mom and baby at the center and surrounded them with the social supports they needed. Mom wasn't late to her prenatal appointment because she wanted to be, she was late because she had to take three buses to get there. Um, and so it was just this acknowledgement from the healthcare community and really built the foundation for us to build upon and create that big change that we sought. Um, and thanks to the, the adapting, the learning, the engaging with moms. Um, and if this doesn't prove trust-based philanthropy doesn't lead to greater impact, I don't know what does because today we can say that we have reduced the racial disparity between black and white infant deaths by a third in Hamilton County. And we have eliminated the racial health disparity between um, extreme preterm birth, which is a leading cause of infant death in 12 neighborhoods. The health disparity no longer exists in 12 neighborhoods around extreme preterm birth. And I can honestly say, I do not believe that this outcome would have been achieved without all the learning and the transparent conversations and building trust and being in the trenches. Thank you so much, Jill. Really speaking to um, the, the actual impact of listening to those who are on the ground, who are living the issues. I mean, in a lot of ways, I do a lot of these conversations and, and have the, the honor of being in community with funders that have been thinking intentionally about their work for many years. And the more I hear these examples, the more it feels like almost like common sense. Um, I mean, it is in a lot of ways, but we have overbuilt 
our processes in philanthropy where we've kind of gotten further and further away of the human element of the work. So that's kind of what we're, we're talking about, like bringing back the human element. Um, you know, as, as Yolanda L said, it's people over productivity. <laughs> you know, that's what we're in this for, right? We're in this work, you know, to, to advance, you know, to, to increase opportunities and, and make things better for people um, and with, with people. So um, we're, this has been amazing. We, we only have about 13 minutes before we, can, we go into our breakout. So um, I wanna invite Yolanda C to just give a, a reflection you know, on what you're hearing and what feels significant to you as a nonprofit leader and these examples that have been shared. Yeah, I would say, you know, for me, this is as I've been more and more exposed to trust-based philanthropy, like emblematic of the, the power of it. I, I think the we, we think of, you know, trust is like, a, I don't know, an abstract concept, not necessarily a set of practices that build relationship, but I think it is like really a fact that trust increases accountability, trust actually catalyzes impact, um, it allows organizations to be fluid in dealing with like human complexity, right? We, when we build bureaucracy, it's kind of to, to simplify something and to be more efficient, but these issues are continually evolving and they get smarter and more sophisticated. You know, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi speaks about that relative to racial equity. So if we're not in dialogue and more kind of fluid relational practices with each other and we set up forms and regulations to engage with each other, we very quickly become ineffective. And so I'm just really, you know, both honored to be here, but appreciative of even just hearing how some of the work has already been transformed across these foundations because of the partnership, not just with the grantees, but with the people grantees are serving. You know, you remain proximate to the issues and then you know how to solve them. Um, it's very easy to lose sight of what's actually effective on the ground if you're just sitting on the balcony, you know, directing um, the, the process. So mm -hmm. just you know, that's my kind of general reflection, great appreciation for the power of these practices. Thank you. And I also wanna lift up, you know, that it, this takes time and, you know, these are really uh, inspiring stories of transformation, but we also don't wanna paint this picture like it's, it's always easy. I mean, what you're hearing and what everyone is sharing is that it's, there's, a humili there's a humility element to this, going into it, recognizing, that you don't have all the answers, you're not gonna get it perfect and it keeps evolving. And Sarah, you spoke to this at the beginning saying you've been on this journey for a number of years and you're still on it. You're still working on it, you're still refining. And I think that's a question I get often of like, what's the best practice in trust-based philanthropy? It's like, it's the best practice is to keep evolving it, right? I mean, and that's, we kind of have to be patient and willing because we live in a dynamic and evolving world that that's just kind of comes with the work, it's just kind of, it's part of the package. And as long as we embrace and accept that and kind of be willing to evolve, then that's when we can see some of these benefits and these impacts that we're talking about. Um, so I wanna spend the last uh, 10 minutes just kind of regrounding in the values that we've been talking about and inviting our speakers to share concrete examples of aligning practice with those values. And again, I wanna acknowledge that maybe these the, the values that we've kind of aggregated on the trust-based philanthropy side are not necessarily verbatim how every foundation will speak to them, but the, the essence of it, I think, exists in everything that we're hearing. So I wanna start and kind of reground us in the working for systemic equity value. Like, what does that actually mean? Because we, we see equity is like thrown around, it's like a, it's a buzzword, right? It's being used all the time. Um, but again, to Sarah's point earlier, we don't really sit down and really reflect like, what does that mean? If we care about this, how are we putting it into practice? Um, so Yolanda Lavender, I wanna to come to you because you were saying that you've really embedded these values in the way you operate as an organization. What are some like practical ways you think about systemic equity in your grant making? Yeah, um, so Shadi, I really see the trust-based approach to the work as equity work, like you, they just exist together. If you're 
approaching it with any kind of intention of you know what it is at its core. Um, so yeah, so those two are are hand in hand. A a really prime example is like even this idea of a written narrative. Like, are we judging whether or not someone can write well? Like, if they've been in the game for twenty plus years, what if they're a new um, you know executive director? So removing the narrative completely boom, let, okay, cool, let's let's get down to this equity thing. Like that's, that's an example of something that we've done um, to be intentional about that. Um, the, the other part of trust-based uh, philanthropy that we, I don't think we talk a lot about is like when the answer is no or not right now um, and the value of those relationships when that is the case of being able to like directly and clearly communicate that, but also keeping the relationship going. So. I've had some of like the most rich and fulfilling uh, conversations that are about accountability on both sides. Um, when when I'm delivering a hey, you know, the decision has been made not to move forward right now. Here's the feedback on how that decision was made. Please ask me any questions that you have about that. We want to continue to be in relationship with you. Um, the fact that that goes a long way as opposed to you never hear from someone if that's the case after you did all this work or you get a letter in the mail and there's no feedback about, you know, what can you do um, differently? So again, just these uh, concrete examples. Um, also, if we're talking about equity, like being able to ask for what it is that you need, I'm excited to hear that other folks um, are doing that. So even making the space for someone to be able to ask for what they need, especially, um, you know, BIPOC, black and brown leading, uh, um, excuse me, directors, being able to ask for what they need and then have the conversation around what that looks like. Um, but again, the space to be comfortable to be able to do that is from the relationship building um, place. And then the last thing that I'll mention uh, is just the intentionality around calling out the power imbalance. So, you know, even when I'm going into a conversation uh, with folks, I always try to be intentional about saying, like, this is not an interview or an interrogation. Like, let's all just relax in this space is, you know, I recognize the power that I have as a funder, but I want you to know that I'm, uh, I want to do everything that I can to shift that uh, back to you and for you to be able to use it um, for your benefit as much as possible. So any acknowledgement, uh, any opportunity to be able to acknowledge that is, is always um, huge. So all of those pieces for me are just all, you know, wrapped up in, in equity. Those are such great uh, pieces of advice, especially that point about just acknowledging the power dynamic. That's something that anyone, regardless of your role, whether if you're not, you know, even if you're coming from a very traditional foundation and you're not in a position to change, you know, from project restricted to multi-year unrestricted, even just the way you show up in that relationship can make a big difference. Like literally just now when Yolanda Lavender said, this is not an interview, I let out an audible sigh of just like, oh, right, you know, like, we're, this is a webinar, but we're here having a human conversation. I mean, just even the language we use is so significant and profound in just building a sense of like, just really setting the groundwork for relationships. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I'm just looking at this clock and I'm like, okay, how are we gonna get to all these other values? But I guess I wanna, you, you did touch upon redistributing power. So I think we're gonna um, uh, move to addressing some of these other ones. Um, embracing learning. Um, so that's another core value of a trust-based approach. And Sarah, I want to bring it back to you because you've talked about how you're constantly learning, you're constantly evolving. Um, what does that mean? Like, what are some ways that you actually put a learning mindset into practice at Satterberg? I think, uh, you know, we came up with a new value. Ultimately, we got to a place where we named lifelong learning as a value. So this is a commitment of learning by doing. It's how we've just shown up in, you know, trying out new practices, getting feedback from community, partnering with community. So to engage in reflection is very much rooted in our culture. We have that value. And so going out and figuring out how to push it further is, um, you know, tangibly, how do we get feedback from our grantee partners, right? How do we get feedback about, is this working? Um, can we commit to trying something and taking a risk? Yes, because this is a place that we do that. And so the family and the staff are really just like trying to push the boundaries. And so since we launched the core support strategy, the multi-year strategy, we were then now able to go back 
out and participate in insight circles for our grantees to offer feedback to help push our grant making even further because we're not there yet if we're not actually acknowledging the moment we're in which is constantly evolving and so if you're committed I'm not saying that you need to change your strategy but if you're listening to folks like Yolanda talk about what they need that's where we need to be showing up constantly checking in is this what you still need what's happening in your community because we don't have the context but to be informed by oh now folks would really prefer a relationship all right do we have the right people working here that can be in relationship are we spending time to build the context of the environment we're working in it's just an ongoing opportunity for us to see our role as the funder and the conduit to helping these leaders and communities get what they need and so figuring out okay, how do you learn in a very tangible way, putting out a survey and getting feedback, but like your commitment to be being open to exploring this and pushing these boundaries further with community is sort of a positionality you have to take as a commitment to learning. And I think that can go for our staff, for our operations, like the values, it's a value inside our organization to just be ready to show up to evolve and change. Mm. And I mean, I think about that. Imagine, you know, how much more interesting and enjoyable it is when your time, when your team's time goes to actually learning, being in community, listening, understanding the work, figuring out how you can use your, your positionality rather than, you know, scrutinizing over project budgets. Right. And, you know, like, this is like, we're talking about a paradigm shift, but it's, but it's more, what you're hearing is there's a, a more, there's passion and connection to the work when you do it in this way. Um, so we're going to take two final thoughts. Jill, I want to bring you in to offer a concrete example of centering relationships and partnering in a spirit of service. You've already sp spoken about this a bit. And then we're going to uh, conclude with a final reflection from Yolanda about accountability. And then we're going to go into our breakout. So thanks, everyone, for, for moving along with us as, as we, we do this. But Jill, we'd love to hear about how you practically embody this idea of centering relationship. Like, what does it look like? Are you going out there? Are you going to your partner's events? And can you share some insights that might be useful for others here? Sure. So um, I do want to highlight, uh, we updated our core values and two of them are being courageous um, and building trust. And to your point, it all starts with your values. Um, grantees need encouragement. They are used to being restricted to achieving specific outcomes. So entering a conversation to say, you know what, we embrace the motto of Nelson Mandela, who said, we never fail, we win or we learn. And that learning piece is so crucial, but in able to learn and have transparent conversations, you have to build trust mm -hmm. um, and you have to listen. Listen and learn is so critical. And so, you know, we, we, can, we try to connect dots where we can, what grantees don't know each other, but should be talking to each other, what other funders could help um, this particular um, initiative? Uh, how do we serve as a conduit when there's, there's breakdowns in communications? How can we build trust between um, partners? Um, to your point, it really brings a lot of joy. Who wants to be on the sidelines when you can be in the game with your grantee? Um, and it's all about relationships. It's about trusted relationships. Um, and and that, that listening piece is so critical. So the, the, the piece I wanna lift up is, as we talk about systems and culture change, programs alone are not gonna solve these issues. And so what we try to do is through the programs that we, we fund, what are those system barriers that our partners are facing that we can view as advocacy opportunities. Um, and a great example of that is, you know, our work in the maternal and infant health space, ob -GYNs kept saying, like, Medicaid coverage. So in Ohio, moms who have Medicaid coverage for pregnancy can lose their coverage in 60 days after they deliver. Um, and that's not enough time. It's not enough time to make sure mom is healthy, mind and body. It's not enough time to prepare for future pregnancies. And so we worked with groundwork um, to help us advocate at the state level, we need to build in budget money for Medicaid to be expanded to, expanded to one year postpartum. Um, and we were able to do that. We just need Medicaid to turn it on. But if you're not engaged in the conversation and you're not really listening to what your grantees need and the barriers they're facing, um, 
then it's the work and the outcomes are just not going to be as meaningful. Mm, thank you so much, Jill. So that is such a, like a, a real example of partnering, committing to that long-term vision, using your influence as a funder, your pl platform you have to offer what we call support beyond the check. So that's going well beyond the dollars, but recognizing that there are systemic barriers to the work your partners are doing. And you have a position of influence that can that can help fuel that work. And that's just such a, a beautiful concrete example. Um, I know we're short on time. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Sorry, if I can, I mean, just one thing I want funders to ask themselves right now is, you know, how much are you giving a grantee and how much are you asking of them? Because how many times has a funder given a $10,000 grant and expected in return all of these outcomes and all of these outputs and we want this and we want these reports like I think just if I can challenge everybody just to think about really how much dollars are we awarding and do those dollars match up with, with what we're asking from our grantees. Thank you. Yolanda C. Um, I would love to give you just a final thought, you know, and it doesn't have to, you don't have to sum it all up, but really just something you, you know, coming as a nonprofit leader, as a nonprofit leader that supports thousands of other nonprofit leaders. What is a, you know, what's something that you hope people kind of walk away from this conversation with, especially as, as many of us go into breakout discussions to talk about this practice? Yeah, you know, I would say I've been sitting here remembering when I first heard about trust-based philanthropy, it was from Phil Lee at the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation and myself and my team were sitting across from him and he's like, oh, so this is what we do here. And we were like, does the rest of the world know? We need you to come and tell all of our leaders what you're up to. Um, and the reason was because it brings joy, it brings hope, it brings possibility to the work and we have so much work to do together. And so I think, you know, as I reflect back on that moment and now, you know, three or four years into this continued movement, um, I think that's the thing I kind of anchor to is if, if we build these things together across the sector, then we all sustain ourselves, our organizations have more integrity, they can weather the difficult storms that we've overcome and continue to work to overcome over the last few years. And we're all stronger for it. And mm. we need to stay in this work together. And I do think relationships fuel that joy um, and trust is what builds them. So, um, that's you know uh, what I'm anchoring back to, and I look forward to sharing with our leaders how much dialogue is happening around these practices to really change the game. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's just take a moment to just give a round of applause to our fabulous speakers: Yolanda Cuentro, Institute for Nonprofit Practice; Yolanda Lavender, Stryker Johnson Foundation; Jill Miller, BI3; and Sarah Walchuk at Satterberg Foundation. Thank you all.